Hi, I'm Nick Lesby, the IoT Ecosystem Manager at Texas Instruments. I'm presenting a five-part training course on understanding secure connectivity in IoT and embedded systems devices. Here I'll be going through the second module, which introduces some core cybersecurity concepts such as authenticity, confidentiality, and integrity and then discusses how these relate to actual security hardware you see on today's microcontrollers. This should assist you in understanding why microcontrollers have certain security features and then how they are used in conjunction with firmware to enforce security on an embedded or IoT device. There are three fundamental concepts that are essential to secure communication. The first is confidentiality, which means that your data cannot be eavesdropped by unauthorized parties. The second is integrity, which means a third party cannot alter your data. And then the final one is authenticity, and that has several aspects to it. The first aspect is that you know the communicating party you're communicating with is exactly who they say they are. The second is that any communication coming in a conversation with that party always came from that party. And then finally, you need the ability to make sure that only authorized parties can access a network. There is a fourth concept that we're not going to really discuss beyond this slide, which is called non-repudiation. This is not so much a security concept, but a legal concept. And it means that a sender cannot deny they sent a message and a receiver cannot deny that they received a message. We're now gonna look at some of the different hardware security features found on microcontrollers and microprocessors. I'm gonna relate these to some of these core security concepts, as well as some of the issues I raised in the first module concerning issues like physical security. You'll generally find that most modern microcontrollers and microprocessors have cryptographic accelerators. These cryptographic accelerators typically cover three different functions. One is symmetric cryptography, another is secure hashing, and the third is asymmetric cryptography. Now we're gonna cover these specific three areas in much more detail in the next module. But for now, what you need to know is that when you see a suite of cryptographic functions, you'll see some such as SHA-2 accelerators, and these are in fact covering secure hashing. You'll see accelerators for AES, for example, which is covering symmetric cryptography. And then you'll see accelerators such as RSA or elliptical curve, that's what the EC stands for, and they cover asymmetric cryptography. Another piece of hardware that's extremely important for supporting uh, efficient cryptography is a true random number generator. So having that on the device as well as these cryptographic accelerators is very important. If we look at how these uh, different cryptographic accelerators support the various core security concepts, you'll see that, for example, symmetric cryptography provides confidentiality through encryption. And in addition, it has something called a MAC, which we'll discuss later in more detail. And that provides integrity and one level of authenticity. Hashing is used for integrity and is also used also for things like digital signatures as well to help provide authenticity. And asymmetric cryptography is used for both confidentiality, but in fact, fairly rarely so, as we'll discuss in the next module, and also used for integrity via digital signatures, as well as authentication. And finally, through digital signatures, asymmetric cryptography also provides non-repudiation. So you can see these core cryptographic accelerator blocks support all these core security concepts. Another hardware security feature found on many embedded microcontrollers and microprocessors is a trusted execution environment. You may recall from the security threats module that one common cause of security breaches was security credentials such as passwords and keys being left exposed in memory 
where an attacker could get to them. The purpose of a trusted execution environment is to secure off part of the memory so that particular code or data could not be accessed by the rest of the general application. If you look at the example here on the left-hand side, for example, you might have some proprietary control algorithm you don't want to be reverse engineered or stolen by a competitor. And you can load that proprietary control algorithm into a trusted execution environment, which means that there's no way that the code there can be accessed at runtime for reverse engineering. Equally important to protecting proprietary algorithms is protecting critical data. Such data might include cryptography keys, passwords, subscriber codes for pay-per-view channels, or credit card numbers. If we go back to the example of the point of sale attack we discussed in the first module, had the credit card numbers been processed inside a trusted execution environment, it would not have been possible for the malware to read them and exfiltrate them from the point of sale terminal. Similarly, if we think of the smart meter, had the cryptography key being in a trusted execution environment, again, the malware could not have gone in and used it to then help modify the parameters that controlled the meter. So the key thing about the trusted execution environment is that it gives you runtime code and data protection. So if malware is successful in getting onto your embedded device, it will not be able to read or modify your critical code or data. In addition to remote attacks, which are done via a network connection and often involve downloading malware on the target, well-resourced attackers may resort to physical attacks where they actually obtain a copy of your product and try and hack into it. To counter this, microprocessors and microcontrollers may offer physical security measures. One of these is called tamper detection. If you ever look at the specifications of a microcontroller or microprocessor, you've probably seen that it has an operating temperature range, certain specified voltages it will operate at, and certain clock speeds it will operate at. An attacker may try to use out of specification values, such as running the chip too slow or at too low a voltage or at too high a temperature. And they hope doing that to trigger some type of fault and unpredictable behavior that allows them to compromise the device and access security keys. The purpose of tamper detection is to monitor temperature, voltage levels, and clocking speeds. And if it detects these are being frequently changed to out of spec values, it can then take appropriate action, which could be simply notifying the application, erasing security keys, shutting the device down, or anything else to prevent the attack being successful. Another area of physical security that needs to be addressed and one that came up in our earlier examples was making sure there is appropriate security on debug or diagnostics ports. Obviously, most microcontrollers or microprocessors have JTAG ports, and these should certainly be disabled uh, in production systems. If you have some other form of diagnostics or debug port, such ports need to be access only via security credentials. So only an authorized person can access them and you should have a good understanding of when and who access them in the case of a breach being discovered. A final issue to consider is whether an attacker might try to probe signals directly on your board, such as memory buses in an attempt to find useful information or to compromise the security of the overall system. To counter this, you may choose to do a secure PCB design in which key signal lines are buried in the board rather than on the surface, or make sure that any critical information that needs to pass over exposed bus lines is encrypted. The hardware security features we've just discussed in the previous slides can be combined with firmware to create additional security solutions. A good example of this is secure storage. Secure storage is required to protect assets such as cryptography keys, 
that reside in memory or software IP such as critical algorithms. Secure storage can be implemented in a number of ways and in fact an individual system might have several different implementations. For example if you have your software image out in flash that is external to a microprocessor or microcontroller you can encrypt that flash by having a secure file system that uses keys to encrypt all the file system's content. That way the software image is encrypted out in the external memory and then decrypted once it's brought inside the chip. You can also purchase specific hardware devices which are called secure elements or often trusted platform modules and these combine public-private key pairs with secure storage and can be added to a particular board for microcontrollers and microprocessors that lack this capability built in. And then finally, the feature we just discussed earlier, a trusted execution environment, also can provide secure storage at runtime, as can a memory management unit. The MMU, or trusted execution environment, can restrict runtime access to certain areas of memory in which you have security credentials or other critical information. Secure boot is another example of where the hardware security features are combined with firmware to offer improved security for an embedded microprocessor or microcontroller. One of the concerns with any embedded device is having it taken over by malware. One way that can happen is that a malware image can be downloaded onto a device and then the device is rebooted and then boots up running that malware which then can perform bot attacks or exfiltrate data or code. The purpose of secure boot is to stop untrustworthy code executing on your device. With secure boot, it starts by taking any software image that will run on an embedded device and signing it. And we're going to cover this in much more detail in subsequent sessions. But essentially, the signing operation requires some of the base cryptography functions we discussed earlier. Apart from they're done on a server or in the development environment. Once the image is signed, it's downloaded along with a signature to the embedded device. The embedded device holds a key, which is the public key equivalent of the private key used to sign it. And then when it boots, it takes the signature of the software image, decrypts it, and then compares it with a hash of the software image. If these match, it knows it's got a correct valid image and can then boot it up. And that way it's not possible for a random malware image to run on the embedded device because it will only boot the signed trusted image. Having looked at some of the hardware security features found on today's embedded microcontrollers and microprocessors, let's look at a specific example. The TI SimpleLink Wi-Fi Wireless MCU is a dual core architecture. This architecture separates the application's microcontroller core from a dedicated network processor. This network processor essentially acts as a trusted execution environment where all secure network functions and secure storage functions are performed. Therefore, it's not possible for an application running on the application MCU core to directly read security keys or other security credentials that are managed by the network processor. This means if malware somehow does get onto the application microcontroller core, it cannot access the security credentials and compromise your system easily. In addition to the separate execution environment that manages network security, the SimpleLink Wi-Fi also has trusted boot where only signed trustworthy images can be booted. This is another defense against any type of malware takeover. When your system goes to production, you can disable the JTAG and debug ports to prevent them being an avenue for a physical attack. The network processor also manages the hardware cryptographic accelerators, which make sure that encryption operations can be formed efficiently. 
In addition to the hardware architecture, there is an on-chip ROM which contains security software, such as a complete secure networking stack with a TLS layer. Uh, TLS is transport layer security and is a standard security protocol used on the internet. It has a secure file system manager, which makes sure that all the code and other data stored out in external flash can be encrypted with a device specific key and also includes storage for various key pairs and includes a burnt in private public key pair that can be used in various security implementations along with a root certificate store and a immutable unique device identity that's also burnt in during production. You'll see some of the uses of things like the device identity and the key pair later on when we explain how things like CSRs and TLS work. Hopefully you understand now from this module and the previous module on security threats, there are many different aspects to security. In the rest of this presentation, we're already going to focus on secure connectivity and secure over the air updates. These are critical functions to pretty much every embedded device that's connected to the internet. We're not going to look at difficult to execute physical attacks. These may have been publicized extensively in the media, such as Spectrum Meltdown, but generally they will not be used against your device. In addition to securing connectivity and secure remote updates, I also want to emphasize that secure boot and secure storage are extremely important in today's embedded devices, although we will not be covering these in further detail. We began by discussing some core cybersecurity concepts, which are confidentiality, integrity and authenticity. We then looked at the various security hardware features available on microcontrollers and microprocessors and discussed how in combination with embedded firmware, such as secure file systems, they can help implement these core security concepts. The next module in the series is entitled How Symmetric and Asymmetric Encryption and Digital Signatures Work. At some point, it's likely you'll want to do some actual software development of a secure connected application. I've put a few links here to enable you to get the appropriate software and evaluation modules to develop secure connected applications on a TI Simple Link Wi Fi device. We have an extensive set of hands on training modules called Simple Link Academy. And if you go there and select, you'll see a number of examples that deal with secure connectivity, secure storage, and cryptography.